Welcome to Trading Strategies for January 2018. I'm Scott Gam, and we are live over the next hour to give you an investing playbook as we kick off the new year. Let's bring in our panel right now. Jeff Marks is Senior Portfolio Analyst for Jim Cramer's Charitable Trust, Action Alerts Plus. Danielle DiMartino Booth is author of Fed Up and a former Fed advisor. Gabriela Santos is a global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. And Stephen Guilfoyle is co manager of the Streets Stocks Under 10 portfolio. Guys, thank you very much for joining us. We all braved the snow. Let's take a live look outside our window. They're calling this the cyclone bomb. We got a good amount of snow on the ground, a couple inches. That's just steps from the New York Stock Exchange. So thanks for braving the elements for us. I want to start off and talk about what an incredible year we had in the markets in 2017. S&P 500 up 19%, Dow up 25%. Jeff, your thoughts here on the incredible run we had last year. Yeah, it was a great year for equities. I mean, very low volatility. Buying the dip worked every single time. Um, we overcame the geopolitical tensions over the summer. The dollar got weaker, which was good for U.S. equities. It was a great year. Danielle, your thoughts? Uh, it was an incredible year in the markets. Um, and, and that was, that was a, as opposed to what everybody, everybody was anticipating. And that's sometimes how markets work, right? Uh, but it was also the year of the yield curve flattening, which we can get to as well. So we are going to talk about that. Different signals coming from different markets in 2017. Yes, Gabrielle, what have you been telling clients? So what I think is really interesting about 2017 is it was certainly a phenomenal year in the U.S., but it was even better abroad. Right? Mm -hmm. So S&P 500 up 19%. Everybody else up 28%. So it was the year that global growth came back and that international actually delivered on the equity side after a pretty miserable six year stretch there where only the US worked. And many strategists expect that trend to continue. Sarge, how about you? Economic growth here and abroad. Liquidity still poured into the market. I'm sure Danielle will touch on that. Uh, is basically, it was it, how could you not like this year as a trader? You, you didn't, it made more of us look smart than actually are. And it made those of us who think we're a little smart feel like we could boast a little bit to our families. Just, just one more point to Gabriella's point and, and to yours. 2017 was record global quantitative easing. That was occurring off our shores. And it showed up in, in offshore markets to a greater extent than it did in ours. But we had a $2 trillion run rate by the time 2017 ended. It, it's as if we're at DEFCON 1 at the global central banks. And that's going to be cut to half in 2018? Half. So can the S&P 500 have another double-digit gain if we have half the QE that we had in 2017? It's, it has. This, this, we're at the 10-year anniversary of QE starting, and I'd love to, to know any of your crystal balls about what you think the, the, the markets can achieve if QE is cut in half. Well, it's going to depend really on earnings growth, which it, it has been based on earnings growth, but can that earnings growth withstand when the Fed is actually a, an extractor of liquidity come April? When... The planet is an extractor of liquidity come September. We have hurdles. I believe that if economic growth is strong enough and, the, and it supports the earnings, that, yeah, we'll have a plus year. I don't see 3,300 on the S&P 500 this year, okay? Mm -hmm. I see something like 2,800, but that's still pretty darn aggressive. Mm -hmm. The economy has to stand on its own. But it's by no means a sure thing. We just had UBS raise their forecast, 3150 on the S&P 500. Did they really? I thought yeah. it was the highest. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone more <laughs> bullish than Sarge. <laughs> well, maybe I'm a little cautious. Although, you know, I, I am a tech stock guy, and I am I'm probably overweight the techs more than I usually am. So I would benefit from UBS's call. I'll go with them. Well, forget the <laughs> numerical gain of the S&P 500 in 2017. Every month was positive. That's never happened before. What does that stat alone tell you about what we're seeing, Gabriella? Well, it, I mean, I, I think everything we're touching on is that last year everything went right. And so you had very low volatility, as we pointed out. We've had um, a series of months of positive returns, an incredible year. It's probably not going to be that easy this year, right? I think that's a pretty easy call to make, um, whether it's uh, hiccups that come with removing some central bank accommodation, whether it's everyone trying to figure out just how much acceleration we really do see in the U.S. economy. And lastly, when we try to figure out when the end of the cycle comes and we touched upon a flattening yields curve, right? So I think these are all things that probably portend higher volatility uh, in 2018 compared to 2017. And we can't ignore today's milestone, the Dow hitting 25,000 for the first time ever. President Trump saying uh, just today that our new number is 30,000. So do we think we'll get to 30,000 by the end of this year in the what Dow? 36,000, right? <laughs> I mean, it was an order. Everything that we're speaking about here... 12 years ago. 
portrays an artificial market. <laughs> all right, it's, it was an artificial market. What, what it does it that was mean? manipulated. Everything from the, the liquidity situation that we've just been speaking about to the coordinated central banks that created coordinated growth. It's, we created a situation where 12 months in the right direction for the S&P smacks of, of the DH rule in the American League. It's bogus. You know what I mean? It's just not something that you can feel comfortable with. But our job as investors, as traders, is to recognize the environment provided, mm -hmm. to adapt to that environment, and to excel within that environment. So it's not, it's not the manipulator's fault if you didn't participate in this rally. Mm -hmm. It's your fault for not getting down and doing your homework. But are you giving the Fed credit for the rally? In I'm giving them credit for my p and But are you giving them credit for the rally in <laughs> Facebook and Amazon and NVIDIA? I mean, it's for not a, all about the Fed. For a piece of it. And the Fed, let's face it, they've been trying to raise rates. They've been trying to do the right thing of late. And I was critical of the Fed for many years, and I still am. But they, they're ahead of the curve as far as the rest of the planet. They've been trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. That said the reinvestment is still adding liquidity, okay? Until, like, until April, they're not really adding to the realization of what I think the markets have, to, to a true market, to, a, to an actual market that is a buyer's and seller's market where price discovery is what counts. But what about Dow 30,000? Is that a 2018 story? No. I mean, no I mean, <laughs> <laughs> if you think about what 30,000 means, right? We're at 25,000, it means you would have to expect a 20% year, right? Um, when we look at the economy, when we look at how far we've come over the past nine years, it's a mature market. It's hard to expect a 20% return year. It's not because we're knocking on the US economy or the market or anything like that. It's just high double digits seems unrealistic for the US equity market at this point. When the Dow rises at least 25% in a year, the following year, on average, it rises 9.6%. So that would not put us to 30,000 historically. 27.5. That's not bad either. <laughs> I'm just going to slice that down the middle, aren't you? <laughs> but, but we have to keep something in mind. Um, you know, 2017, among other things, record after record after record, was the year of the natural disaster. Hmm. The automobile industry was already in a technical recession, year-over-year year decline before Hurricane Harvey made landfall. And then it did. And the rebuilding effort, the supply chain disruption, the amount of jobs that have been created in all of the industries that are, that are, that are pouring into the rebuilding effort. And, and they, you know, they've barely just gotten the second major wildfire contained in California. This is going to push GDP growth mm. in the first quarter up. We could see a 3% handle year-over-year mm. By the time the first quarter comes to an end, but on the front page of the Wall Street Journal today, what did it say? Bannon. Well, it did say and Bannon. auto sales. <laughs> yeah. And auto sales. Auto sales were negative year over year, and we're we're looking for that to resume this year. We've seen we've seen eight nine months of, of automobile delinquencies ticking up, and they're already pushing um, the worst levels of the recession. So, so underlying the economy, there's definitely weakness in the U.S. household sector. We just need to maintain our pace of natural disasters. <laughs> well, looking out the window at this storm, I'm thinking that we're off to a great start. I'm a little self-short for the year, too, even with that boost. So well, that. you bring up a good point because a lot of the companies that are levered to those rebuilding efforts haven't even realized those gains. Jeff, you guys for Action Alerts Plus own Waste Management. Yeah, so Waste Management, they, have ton of, they do a ton of business in Florida and Texas region. They've, uh, management's been telling us that there's going to be a benefit. It's not realized yet. They're thinking fourth quarter, so maybe we'll hear that soon or maybe we'll get it in the first quarter. And then back to your point on the auto, um, right before all the hurricanes hit, everyone was talking, again, peak auto. We saw tons of analyst downgrades on uh, company, excuse me, companies related to auto come through, hurricanes hit, all of a sudden those stocks all flied uh, once again. So it'll be an interesting dynamic to see how it plays out this year. And just another point on the broader market, you know, the Wall Street Journal quoted a Bank of America analyst saying, if 2017 is the year of optimism, Maybe 2018 will be the year of euphoria. And we know from John Templeton that bull markets die on euphoria. So, Danielle, well, what do you make of a forecast like that? I, I don't doubt that, that we're going to see a 3% handle on GDP, a 3% handle on, on unemployment, and we could see a 3,000 handle on the S&P. Hmm. When markets are behaving in this way, the greater risk is a melt up. And that's huh. Jay Powell's worst nightmare. Hmm. Danielle? Or uh, Gabrielle? <laughs> <laughs> Close. Two brunettes. <laughs> Close. Um, Look, I think we would agree 2018 is probably actually going to be uh, a bit of a sugar high year for the U.S. economy. We also expect 3% growth, 3.4% um, on the unemployment rate by the end of the year. 
that probably means some four rate hikes from the Fed. So it's not quite the end of the cycle, but it's an acceleration for an economy that's really, in terms of if you think a little bit longer term, not going to be able to sustain that pace of growth. And so double digits yeah. on the market seems hard to, to sustain as but well. But what you've just described is 1999, <laughs> 2000. How so? The economic data points, they line up. We have not seen, we, we never did see sub 4% unemployment rate in the last cycle. You have to go back mm -hmm. to the late 1990s to see those sub 4% levels. And the market was very overvalued at that point, too. Well, let's talk about correction risk, because we had Blackstone Vice Chairman Byron Wien out with his 2018 predictions. He's expecting a 10% correction in the S&P 500, but he thinks we'll end the year above 3,000. So, Sarge, what do you make of a forecast like that? I think I'd buy him down 10%. <laughs> why, why not, right? Okay, I think we all can sustain a 10% loss at this point, okay? If you've been playing this game for more than a year, you can sustain a 10% loss in an effort to gain higher, all right? In the meantime, trailing stops, all right? If you're a home gamer, like many of our people are, well, make use of what you have. Use your options market. Use your trailing stops. Protect those stocks where you have your gigantic gains. Play around with the ones that aren't up so much, maybe. But if you have something like NVIDIA and you haven't done anything with it, one, I think you're a little crazy, because I have it too, but I play with it all the time. I mean, buy yourself some down. Don't buy yourself protections. Sell some protection, because I hate buying protection. It just wastes money. It goes out the window. It's gone. Poof. Right? But you can protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Jeff, the trust owns NVIDIA. Yeah, and I mean, the rally that NVIDIA's had in the last two days has been absolutely yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but we think there's still going to be more there. Um, Jensen Huang speaks uh, this weekend at a CS, uh, CES conference in Las Vegas. He's a keynote speaker Sunday night. He's very visionary. You know, he, we think what, um, some of his comments might lift the stock again. So we're holding for now, but, and we'll see what happens this is weekend. Kruzan, is Kruzanich going to say anything coming up? Uh, we'll see. I want to hear from yeah. him. All right, because mm -hmm. he's going to either help or that's hurt the, that whole industry. That's the story right now with the semis, <laughs> but yeah, we'll see. So there's an elephant in the room here. Mm. This is, it's been since Paul Volcker was in office that there was a non-academic running the Federal Reserve to say nothing of somebody who's, whose background is in finance. The working assumption, every time I send out a tweet about potentially a correction, QE4 to the rescue. Powell's on the record saying he regretted voting for QE3. So it's going to be a matter of how does the Fed react if there's a correction, and we don't know. But he wasn't Fed chair at that time. and he do was you, not. Do you think that any Fed chair, whether it's Jay Powell or anyone else, would want to have a market meltdown on their watch? Well, of course not, because that would indicate, given the preponderance of consumption in this country that is dependent upon kind of the top two quintiles of earners, Nobody wants to see that because then you're talking about a recession. Mm. And that's, that's a no-no if, if you're running a central bank. Mm. But the question is, again, will it be QE? Mm. I don't know. But Scott, I think, you know, when we look at that prediction of a 10% correction this year, it's, it's just probability, right? So mm. if you look at the market back to the 80s, you get a 14% correction on average, 10% is a median. I mean, it, it's, it's very likely. And it doesn't mean it's a recession, the end of the cycle, bear market. It's just a normal behavior of the equity market. And we should absolutely expect it. And we talk to our clients a lot about that, taking that in stride and not extrapolating anything more sinister than just a, a normal breather for the market. So how do you prepare for that? Do you keep some dry powder on the side in case Byron is right here in 2018? keep dry powder on the side. I mean... The home gamers should have 20 percent of their money in cash at all times. You never know when the garage door is going to go or the boiler is going to leak. I mean, this is stuff that the regular person has to always be prepared for. And if you need to create capital, you do so. But I mean, but you always got to have. I mean, I always say 20. Right now, I'm at 33 percent. To be honest with you, I'm bullish and I'm at 33 percent cash. Mm -hmm. And what did I write last week? I was at 48 percent. Right? I, I mean, you got to swing this thing around. But you never go below 20 percent if you're sitting there on your computer. But that's not what's happening in retail accounts. Mm -hmm. In retail accounts right now, whether you're talking about TD Ameritrade or Schwab, we have record low levels of cash on hand and record high levels of confidence in that stock market scary. gains in the next 12 months. You do the math. Yeah, I don't like that at all. Although, just to add to the bull case, we haven't really talked about tax reform yet. The tax cuts are here, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Tax reform, the corporate tax rate going from, you know, 39% to 21%. You know, Jeff, what does that mean for the broader markets? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a real bottom line impact that these companies are going to have. And it's going to be, what do they choose to do with the money? Is it going to be reinvestment, buybacks, dividends, uh, mergers and acquisitions, combination of the sorts? Um, I, I'm expecting a lot of... Uh, buybacks to occur. I think that might be option one. 
What I want to see, I want to see a lot of companies clean up their balance sheet, open them up to future opportunities, especially when the future may be a little un uncertain years from now. Um, but I mean, look at waste management, prime example. We talked about this just before. They had a huge um, uh, price target raised yesterday off of tax reform, what it's going to do their free cash flows. So I think a lot of these companies, domestic based, are going to have real real impacts to their stocks. Are there any stocks in the portfolio that you think would engage in M&A activity in 2018? Yeah, so we own, we own Honeywell. Um, I, I don't think it will be a direct result from tax reform because their balance sheet's already pretty clean, but they are spinning off their non-core assets later in the year. Um, they might want to bulk up their core positions this year by going out in the market and beefing up aerospace, for example. So that's one option. Gabriella, you could argue that this, these tax cuts are a once-in-a-lifetime phenomenon for the markets. Mm. And it's hard to not be bullish on the markets when we have this. So I think we have to separate two things, right? So it's the effect that these tax cuts have on earnings and on the economy for the next 12 months, for 2018. And that's where we were talking about a sugar high, right? A temporary increase to 3% growth or double-digit earnings growth, separate that from a fundamental change in economic growth, meaning sustaining that 3% growth for the next decade, two decades. And that's something that really needs to be worked out over 2018, and it's all about what companies use that cash for. Do they really ramp up CapEx? Or is it just that sugar high? Well, we're seeing a lot of companies give $1,000 bonuses to their employees. Danielle, this has got to show up in the Fed's calculus this year when it comes to wage pressure? Well, I think that, that that is going to be one of the components that adds to wage pressures as well as what I'll go back to, which is these natural disasters. I mean, there are people leaving walk of day jobs to, to go become truck drivers because the pay is so amazing. You've got pricing power in so many industries right now as an employee mm -hmm. and people are flocking to get those jobs. The flip side of it is, if 2017 was the year of brick and mortar bloodshed, 2018, the echo is going to be in, in large restaurant chains. And they've been a huge creator of jobs in the current recovery. Well, we saw the Fed mention or d discuss tax reform right in the minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, Fed officials were talking yeah. about that in the December meeting. Will they have to move faster with rate hikes in 2018 because well, of the possibility of wage increases? Yeah. Uh, the minutes do not have anything in them by accident. In, in, in December 2008, uh, Janet Yellen is on the record in Fed transcripts is saying that minutes are something that should be utilized as a tool. Hmm. So meaning the Fed rewrites the minutes well after the meeting has come and gone. So the fact that the tax reform is in that discussion, that's why those minutes yesterday were seen as being as hawkish as they were. Hmm. So maybe four rate hikes in 2018. That, that was what the, that's, I think that's what the Fed is trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. Gabriella, four rate hikes, what do you think? That is definitely our call. Um, so if we look at the forecasts, right, they're really only signaling two and a half percent growth even with these expectations uh, penciled in of, of tax reform. Uh, the unemployment rate, really only a little bit below 4%. We think we're going to overshoot in all these aspects. And so that likely means it's an upside risk uh, for rate hikes, four instead of three. Sarge? I wouldn't count on four rate hikes. Mm. Why not? All right, because Jay Powell's a pragmatic guy. He's a smart guy, and he's been a businessman. He's going to play this by ear. Mm. As the liquidity starts coming out of the market, as the ECB, who might actually get the say in this, decides what they're going to do in September. If Super Mario decides to keep buying everything under the sink, okay, well, four rate hikes, all right? Mm -hmm. But if, if things get tougher, they may have to slow things down. They may just go with two hikes or three hikes, or maybe it's folly just to, just to wonder about anything more than a month out. Danielle, do you agree? You know, I don't think that they'll get to four. I saw some great back-of-the-envelope math recently, and that's for every 25 basis point rate hike, you can pull $50 billion of GDP out of the economy. Tax cuts are going to add $100 billion to earnings. Tax cuts are going to add $80 billion to GDP. All you need is two rate hikes in 2018 to negate the positive economic impact of those tax cuts. And I think Jay Powell knows how to do that simple math. Will markets react positively to more rate hikes in 2018? I mean, obviously, we had a few in 2017 in the market surge. My feeling is that if they can get the higher, the longer end of, of the yield curve to move, it, it, once it starts approaching 3%, then equities will have a much tougher road to go. Mm. I That's think it gets happening. tough there. So no, it's not happening yet. But then again, we just mentioned the ECB. I don't think we can ever count on the BOJ to do anything because they've been irrational for 30 years. But the ECB. That's harsh. Well, <laughs> how long have they been on a death spiral? Right? They haven't figured this out yet. 
Right. What's interesting though is is there is this very stealth tapering that's happening oh, from the BOJ. Absolutely, they've right? gone from eighty to fifty billion. A, right, just a, a, a with month. their yield curve control. And it's so because they're it's seeing a little growth mechanistically. Yeah. Mechanistically, yeah. mechanistically. Yeah. Inflation. There is there is there is hope for them because they are they are speaking the right game of late. They got a long way to go, but the ECB is the next one mm -hmm. that's going to matter. So that's the third central bank that's kind of removing stimulus from the market Against in 2018. Against will, but yes. Uh, you know, it was one of the fascinating untold stories of 2017 is that the head of, of, of Japan's largest stock exchange came out, lost face, mm. and asked Kuroda, for God's sake, would you get out of the ETF market? Right. The stock market doesn't function properly anymore. And in the latest Bank of Japan minutes, there was actually talk of backing away from ETF purchases mm. because they, they practically own the entire market. Mm. You know, we, we talked about Dow 25,000 earlier today, and it was largely led by the banks. Jeff, for Action Alerts Plus, you guys have a, quite a few banking stocks. City, Key Bank, and you just initiated J.P. Morgan Chase. What's your banking outlook for 2018, especially if we do get four rate hikes? Yeah, I think the rising rate environment is the key, you know, first thing that you'll look for in the financials. Another thing is going to be the uptick in volatility, which is just a reversion to the mean at this point. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we like with the big internationals, um, specifically J.P. Morgan, is that um, their uh, tentacles and all the international businesses um, with this new rate, uh, rate cuts, industrials are going to look to... Um, uh, borrow money from international banks, um, such as J.P. Morgan, with their presence across the globe. I, we think that will be additional business for them. Uh, um, and J.P. Morgan, we like for its um, strong uh, earnings growth. Versus City, we 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 feel more as like a value play. Um, so that's why we just recently added J.P. Morgan. Sarge, you like City as well? I'm in City for the value. I, I see that. I'm also in Key Regionally, just like you, you are. are. I saw that you guys initiated J.P. Morgan. Now I'm dragging my feet on that one. I. I'm in KBE also. I don't need more exposure to financials right now because I don't trust that 10-year year, uh, end of the yield curve. I don't trust the 30-year. I don't mm -hmm. trust that enough to invest more money in the financials. I am, however, in EUFN, which is the European uh, mm -hmm. financial ETF, because I do think Mario has to step on the gas, because their policy is downright inappropriate yeah, at this point. We felt a little underweight to the financials. city has been a, a great source yeah. of profits for us. Um, and again, we like J.P. Morgan because we just felt it had more earnings power well, compared to I a city. I might be behind you on that. Yeah. I'm just dragging my feet to see if it works for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, the banking, <laughs> <laughs> the banking ETF that you mentioned is up over 40 percent since the 2016 election. Is that a little worrisome for you, Gabriella? I mean, yes, financials have recently done well, but that was after a few years where they were not performing necessarily the strongest, and that's still underperforming when you think about how much technology did last year, right? Um, we would agree with a lot of the points that were made. There are so many positive ingredients for the financial sector, be it rates, um, we haven't mentioned deregulation as well, or just smarter regulation, lower taxes certainly benefits the financial sector, and then just the continued positive environment in the economy. Actually, you have to give the president credit for the deregulation and for the weak dollar. Mm. He's not doing everything wrong, guys. He's doing some things right, and some of them are helping the economy. No, mm. definitely not saying he's, uh, he's not. Uh, I don't know your personal <laughs> views. I'm just saying that there, there are a couple of things here that have been working in the right direction. So I'm, I'm, before, we, yeah. before we move off the, the discussion of the banks, uh, I'll put my contrarian hat on here. Moody's put out their 2018 outlook for the banking sector, and they said all of the positives that have been, that have been mentioned around this table, um, and, and they're, they're completely on board, but they did mention commercial real estate experience exposure at the banks, and then automobile and credit card uh, uh, loss provisions going up as well. So they, they, they raised those as being some red flags going into 2018. Actually, those credit cards scare me a bit. Because well, the regular City, folks are spending more than they're bringing in. When, when Citi comes out and says in a press release, we're raising loan loss provisions on credit cards faster than we anticipated, that, that's not a good sign. But that now you have your $1,000 bonus to pay off your credit well, card debt. That'll help. Yeah. But that means mom and dad are, are trying to maintain the standard of living and right. they're not telling the kids what's happening. Exactly. Mm. My, my favorite leading economic indicator is we've had 24 consecutive months of credit card growth outpacing income growth in this mm. country. That's not Which good. means mom and pop, a lot of U.S. households are starting to fill, fill up the gas tank and put food on the table with the credit card. So That's why are financial conditions easing, even though the Fed has raised rates, what, five times since 2015? The Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index has been coming down. Because the markets are melting up. It's pretty easy. That's it? That's well, it. Still it doesn't worry you, that, that, that dynamic, that the Fed is actually having the opposite effect? Look, Merrill Lynch's uh, Michael Semblist came out at the beginning of 2017 and said, there's no way markets go down when you have, glo when you have quantitative easing globally at a record. He said, it's just, it won't happen, and it didn't. Mm. So you search for yield, dude. Mm. 
Well, so, I mean, yeah. right. So there are a few components within the financial conditions. So it is the market going up. It's spreads remaining really, really tight for things like high yield. High yield. It's the dollar falling. Um, and ultimately, we always come back to this idea about it's our view that we're still in the piece of normalizing policy where it's normalizing. Mm. It's still not tightening conditions. It still allows the economy to continue growing. And that is why we see all these positive things happening in, in financial markets. So okay. let's let's That's talk really about... Support. Yeah, let's talk about the, the flattening yield curve uh, that's on its way towards inverting. Break that down for us. Why is it such a threat for the markets? Well, uh, look, it, with all due deference to Fed officials who are continuously and increasingly saying the yield curve doesn't matter, and by the way, the yield, I've never seen the yield curve discussion come out in the minutes before. There's a lot of dissent around the table, and that was really apparent in those minutes. They mentioned it yesterday they in the minutes. They mentioned the yield curve in the minutes, the spread between the 2 and the 10. So I was that, because Jay Powell believes yeah, yield curves matter. Charge. But <laughs> yield curve, the flatness of the yield curve more than anything else to investors reflects fear. Mm -hmm. And fear is something that as a central banker, you can't get your arms around. So the closer we get to the zero line, the more fear it's going to introduce into investors' minds, at least ones that have been around since yield curves flatten. And Jeff, Je Jeff, that has to be a risk, though, for the for the banks, right? As yeah, and I think one thing we're, that we're watching there is, especially with the rising you know, voice of maybe some dissenters, is that the markets don't like unpredictability. So if we go into an, um, an interest rate decision where it's you know a little bit unsure of what's going to happen, that's where we're going to see the volatility spike up. One quick thing I'd say in terms of the yield curve for banks is if you think about, we're just talking about the yield curve as the two tens difference, right? But if you look at what margins are for banks. They haven't been increasing uh, the interest on savings, for example, but they have been increasing right. the cost of, of loans on the long end. So actually, done that before. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's not at the challenging flattening mm. for the financial sector quite yet. But do customers start to demand more right. interest in their Eventually accounts? Eventually it will, right? right. But and we're beginning to see a lot of that in, in the press, and this bank and that bank, and they're paying more mm. on savings. And it's, it's a different dynamic in this current environment because money is much more, money can walk much more easily now that we're all electronic. Mm -hmm. You're not walking down to your local bank branch and, and no. you know, shifting, physically taking money out. Maybe people, can, people can make decisions based on savings rate just like that. Let's talk about other opportunities across the markets for 2018. Sarge, what other stock plays are you looking at? What did you think of some of the retail news that we got this morning? Macy's, JCPenney reporting positive same-store sales growth during the holiday season. Funny you ask. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, actually, I, I actually sold about 30% of my stake in Intel uh, in the wee hours this morning right before I broke market recon, uh, just because I didn't like the way that was playing out. And I put that money into Macy's. Really? So I actually increased my retail holdings from Kohl's and Walmart to Kohl's, Walmart, and Macy's. Mm. Uh, Can we tell people we know you? Oh, <laughs> do you know how great the retail sector's been to me? All right. I, I owned Walmart and Kohl's all year. Well, when, when retail was getting its butt kicked all year, mm. guess which retailers were kicking butt all year? Those two, all right? Mm. They both pay a nice dividend. They both make money. Kohl's is the little pal to Amazon, and Amazon's not going to squash it because they do everything Amazon wants. They take their returns. They, they sell their products in the stores. Walmart, they're the opposite, all right? They're going to confront Amazon on every level. They're going to fight them in the streets. They're going to fight them by the flagpole after school. And this is going to be a showdown, and I'm long both stocks. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, maybe we are at peak Amazon. Jeff, I, I mean, is this Amazon threat getting a bit out of hand in some cases? Um, I, I wouldn't say out of hand. I mean, they, it is tough to pinpoint what they're going to do next. I mean, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we just heard that maybe they were interested in buying XPO Logistics, which we used to own, and, and no one that was unconfirmed whether their interest was there. And, and that was same with Home the, Depot. Home Depot, yeah. sorry. Uh, well, no, it was Amazon to buy XPO Logistics, and Home Depot Home was involved in the right. conversation as well to um, keep, uh, keep out Amazon sure. from buying XPO. We don't think XPO is going to get bought from either of the two. We think um, XPO is more likely a buyer of another company than a seller. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then FANG related, I, 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 st I think that um, some of the other FANG names, Facebook, Alphabet, Apple, um, they're still relatively cheap on next year's earnings. Mm -hmm. So I think that those, can, those stocks can still be bought. And, and, and you we guys, own those for the trust. You yeah. guys recently exited TJX and Starbucks. So what kind of retail spots would you be looking at potentially in 2018? Yeah, so we, we exited those in a, a right when um, 
right when tax reform was occurring and those stocks were rallying and the prices were just too good to pass up. Mm -hmm. um, for next for retail, um, we're looking at retail, maybe some restaurant names. We think that some of the um, you know, added bonuses from uh, like Comcast coming in and, and maybe some other uh, you know, wage growth might increase their spending. You know, maybe they're not paying off the credit cards and maybe you know, people, when they get money, they like to spend it. So I think maybe that's where maybe just that will come. The restaurants are getting taken out of the woodshed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, What do you think? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it depends on which restaurant you're talking about. It's, it's the restaurant chains that are most exposed to the malls that are, that are not going to survive. So mergers, so that does help you. Yeah. So and Amazon <laughs> will actually encourage other types of mergers, especially in the, in the healthcare space. Sure. I mean, that's well, we that's like CBS clockwork. Aetna, yeah. Right. And, but I think you'll see a continuation of that. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, at the Challenger Gray and Christmas uh, layoff data, you'll see that, that restaurants and healthcare are starting to lay people off. Mm -hmm. And you'll see more of that if there are more combinations. Gabriella, what sectors are you telling clients to focus on in 2018? So we talked about financials. Um, the other one we still don't think is, is over is technology. Mm. Uh, and people, d I think, tend to want to say, you know, do you like financials or tech? Do you like value or growth? For us, we're saying there's opportunity in both. For technology, it's, it's yes, the structural story, but let's not forget that's also a sector that has over 50% of its earnings coming from abroad. We mentioned really, really great global growth. And we think this trend of a weaker dollar is set to persist for next year, for the years ahead. Mm -hmm. So that's that kind of international sector that we think still has plenty and of And every legs. other sector depends on it. Mm -hmm. And every other sector yeah. does. So tech's not going anywhere. I like tech. Yeah. Well, what about energy? We're seeing oil, WTI hold above 60 a little bit. Uh, Sarge, what do, you, what do you think about I actually energy? like energy going forward, okay? Not, not just for tax reasons, I, I think it's time. Uh, it's, we're seeing support here above 60, WTI. We're seeing $3 support in natural gas, finally. I mean, thank you, for, thank you to old man Winter. But I mean, but some stocks are moving the right way. I know I always tell you I like Schlumberger and I like Apache. I like Schlumberger and I like Apache, all right? They're finally going the right way. They're both significant winners at this point. Uh, and and I, I wrote about COG this morning, Cabot Oil and Gas. I think this is a play you can go out both ways, maybe do an options thing, selling straddles, going out on a rising trend. I know that's a lot for folks to take. You can email me if I need to explain that. But I think COG is probably a name you can play as a trader, not an investor going out. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you guys own some oil names, like Sarge mentioned, Schlumberger, Simarex, Apache. Yep, we like those too. And, and another one that we really like is Magellan Midstream Partners. Um, that's one that we own. Oh, yep. are they helping Apache? So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, no, Kinder, Kinder Morgan. Morgan. Oh, Kinder, Kinder Morgan. Morgan. Yeah, that's helping Kinder Morgan passion. had the big okay. pipe. Um, but so the, ML, the MLPs, they got destroyed in 2017. Um, a lot of people are flooding money into, their, um, into that region now. Um, almost every year people speculate, is this going to be the end where the tax benefits MLPs um, you know, ends? It didn't happen this year. MMP, that's its infrastructure. There's a pretty big spread between Brent and WTI. Mm -hmm. The um, WTI crude is going to need to get exported out. We think MMP is, is, a, is a good play there. And GE has quite a bit of exposure to the oil sector. The stock was rallying today, best day, I think, in over two months. It's rallying every uh, day sport. Well, yeah. GE had a great day today. Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's tough to read um, specifically through to this rally so far. Um, just it's, it's only been three days this year. It could be a lot of people getting back in from maybe tax law selling, mm -hmm. things like that. So it, that's, that's wait f a few more days, weeks, before we really say is GE back. Okay. I, 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 well, I don't like GE. I'm long a lot of GE. Okay? Mm -hmm. I sold a bunch of puts and that went against me. So here I am owning a lot of GE, but fortunately kind of towards the bottom. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think it is tax law selling that's coming back into the marketplace a little bit. I, I think it's the January effect, so to speak. So I think we're going to see a little bit of benefit here. Let's dig deeper, deeper into this whole notion of foreign stocks outperforming U.S. stocks. Gabriella, you alluded to it earlier. Uh, S&P 500 Global Broad Market Index up 22% in 2017, so a little bit better than the S&P 500. And even better if we do take, a, I don't know about that index, but if we look at the MSCI All Country World XUS, which was up 28% last year, um, we alluded to that. I mean, it's, it really is the year that global growth came back. Mm -hmm. But after, let's remember, six really, really tough years. So it's just the first year in a really much longer uh, cycle here. If you think about regions like the Eurozone, like Asia, like Latin America, there is so much more room to run in some of these other regions than there is in the U.S. And that's really market perform. If you look at the Dow up 25 percent and NASDAQ up even higher. And a lot of those foreign MSCI uh, indices are really heavy in tech, more so than our indices are. So mm -hmm. that's probably just market performed, to be truthful. Danielle, your outlook for the 
global stock market? Um, so I'm always looking for risk factors, uh, and I, I was a little bit surprised that the Italians called for an early election. Um, so I, mm. I, for, for, for the first few months of the year at least, and, until we get through these uh, Italian elections in March, because the Europeans have had a great run of election results mm. that have been very positive for, for making sure that there's calm throughout the region. So I'll be interested to see what, the, what, the, what that particular out, um, outcome is. Say that that's interesting about last year in terms of the political risk for the eurozone. It became less about this massive tail risk of disintegration right. and departure and rupture from the entire project, and it's now become much more domestic political risk, right? Which is going to be around. There are 19 countries that use the euro. There'll always be elections, right? Every year. Absolutely. So but, but, but bear in mind, certain countries are a lot more dependent on quantitative easing than others. Mm -hmm. And Italian, mm -hmm. Italy is one of them in a big way. Mm -hmm. Just gives, it heartens me a little bit that if you look at euro skepticism or support for the euro mm -hmm. in certain surveys, it has been going up. So it does remove some of that tail risk uh, for from, us. From those countries? From, yeah, from <laughs> Italy, from Spain, France, and Germany. They're, yeah, the, 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 the Greece up. bond yields just fell below ours. Mm. Uh -huh. But Jeff, I mean, there's certainly an argument <laughs> for <laughs> buying the broader European stock market <laughs> as you have done for Actual Earth Plus. Yeah, so I mean, we don't want to pinpoint one stock to buy just because of all of what's going on in each country. And it's, it's just rather to play the ETF, you get exposure to a bunch of different countries. Um, we like the EZU. Um, it doesn't have the UK because just the uncertainty around Brexit we want to just stay clear of. Um, but it, it play, play them all at once. That's, that's our rationale there. And, and do you think it's time for Mario Draghi to lift interest rates out of negative territory in the Eurozone? Yeah, I, I think that they need to raise rates. I mean, the PMI was was the fastest acceleration in seven years. Um, I, I think it's time. They, um, yep. Danielle, I'm it's sure you have a lot of thoughts. He <laughs> is playing with fire on that one. Mm. Um, Peter Buchvar's done some great math on QE in Europe versus QE in the United States. Mm. When when I was at the Fed, when when QE was at the maximum run rate, it, it was about seventy percent of of Treasury uh, Treasury issuance. Mario Draghi did seven times what issuance was. I mean, he is playing with fire with that bond market of his, and he needs to tread very lightly, and he is as paranoid as they come. But bear in mind, this time next year, we'll have the name of the German in hand who's going to be running the ECB after Mario Draghi. We'll know by summer who his replacement's going to be. Why is Mario Draghi so cautious? I mean, all the data shows that his plan has worked largely. Because Greek bond, bond yields are below everybody. treasuries. I mean, because he's got the most... It's, he's got the most overvalued bond market on the planet. I mean, he, again, you have to be very careful in, su in such an environment, and he knows it. He knows he's created a mess. Ultimately, what, what we think is going to happen is he's going to continue being extremely cautious in terms of not trying to get the market too ahead of itself. So in terms of raising rates, probably only a 2019 kind of conversation. First, they need to actually end the QE program, right? And, and if we follow in the, foot, in the Fed's footsteps, it was a while after QE ended that rates actually started being raised, especially on a more consistent basis. So it's still a very slow process. You know, what does it look like to you guys when they actually try to unwind their balance sheet? Or when the BOJ goes there? Oh, I mean, is, look, that, is that clean water and well, ammunition, ammunition the, time? The and ECB had a, has a junk bond on its balance sheet. I mean, <laughs> when you start getting into credit allocation, these things will happen, and now they're holding a junk bond. I think they got boxes of pencil cases and stuff like that on their balance sheet. I think they bought it's, everything. I mean, this is, I mean, it's, it's so completely interconnected that the Swiss National Bank and their support of our stock market, I mean, this whole global QE experiment is so massive that nobody with a straight face can tell you what the unwind's going to look like. But nobody. the Fed has been unwinding their balance sheet for a couple oh, months well, now. They're still adding liquidity. No, no, they're, no, no. They're still it's pushing been unwind pulling, Yeah, but right? it's been still unwinding. <laughs> We've started it at least. Barely. I mean, barely. That's why April The roof is still up. That's why April matters <laughs> is right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just, I mean, look, if, if, if we really get there, and that's going to be Jay Powell's real test, because quantitative tightening, the unwinding of the Fed's balance sheet is quote unquote not data dependent. Mm -hmm. It's going to continue regardless of what happens in the economy. Rate hikes are data dependent, but according to Fed commitment, Fed communique, the unwinding of the balance sheet is not data dependent. So do they let that thing run up to $420 billion by the end of the year? 
uh, of take, taking that liquidity out, we will see. That's going to be his test. He's got a hard job ahead of him. Oh, my gosh. I mean, they, everybody gives Janet Yellen all this credit. Maybe it's deserved. I don't know. But but it, Janet Yellen had the, written the last chapter. She, she had the grandkids. She gave them all candy canes. said, go wild, guys. And here you go, Jay. <laughs> you know, exactly. it's bedtime. Here you go, Jay. The kids well, are fired well, up. Sarge, you, you mentioned your European <laughs> banking ETF. Uh, sounds like you're a little bit worried about Europe. Well, I think he's going to. I think it's been it's past time where where they where it's appropriate to start tightening European monetary policy. I bought this ETF months ago, thinking they were gonna, they had to go then. So I'm ahead of Mario Draghi on this. Mm. It's hard to not be ahead of Mario Draghi <laughs> on anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, MyFid2, this new European banking regulation now in effect. Gabrielle, is this a reason maybe to shy away from some of the European banks? No, we're actually quite positive on European banks. And it's yes, it's going to be slow moving in terms of normalizing European policy, but it's still moving in that direction, right? So ultimately, it should mean higher bond yields in Europe, slowly, hopefully, so it's not too disruptive. Um, and credit is still growing incredibly well in the region. So those are two really big positives. Didn't for, I see for the majority of, the, of EU countries haven't even adopted this rule or it's not on their in their on their laws, so to speak. Did I see only like 11 out of 28 countries, something like that, have adopted it? Well, it's quite strenuous, strenuous yeah. the, the regulations. The There's like a phasing period, and only 11 move towards adopting it, I think, <laughs> well, something well, like that. Well, plus, obviously, a lot of the banks have exposure in Europe and the U.S., so if Europe has a different set of rules than us, how does that dynamic play out? Ultimately, well, I think the question, perhaps, about MIFID too and, and the banking sector is, does it really cause a, a massive fall in terms of trading volumes, right? And is that a problem for the European financial sector? And I think it's a bit too early to tell, um, given it's still pretty early in January. People are still kind of on vacation mode. For the week. But, but it yeah. is still kind of vacation mode, let's say, um, over true. in Europe. So a little too early to tell, perhaps. Let's also talk about the surge in Bitcoin, or should I say the declines in Bitcoin, because it's actually down since its peak in mid-December at about 14,500 now. Sarge, will the Bitcoin hype fade this year, do you think? I don't think the publicity will, will fade. I think I'm glad it's found a level where it stopped going up. It, but it, it goes parabolic every three or four years, if you look back. So maybe, maybe that was this year's run. Maybe in three or four years we have another run. I, yeah, there is a finite, like this year. There is a finite supply. So if it does become a store of value, which it's working on, and if it ever becomes a medium of exchange, which is probably not going to happen, but maybe the guys who love it say so, then it's actually going to be worth something. To me, I'm not going to buy any for, for quite some time. If I saw a dip, now it's silly to say because if I saw a dip, I'd get out of the way. So no, I'm not going to buy any Bitcoin. Would you buy the futures? I will play the futures. I probably, if the futures get to a point where margin isn't so crazy, I'll probably get involved, but small. It'll never be, it'll never be more than a percent and a half of my portfolio. Mm. Danielle, obviously there's this whole question about when a central bank will come out with their own cryptocurrency or back one. How is the Fed viewing Bitcoin? Um, so I think that they're definitely uh, looking for flaws in Bitcoin. They're, they're, they're studying the infrastructure very closely. The Bank of England uh, came out just a few days ago and said that they're looking into creating their own electro, uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, so I found that to be fascinating because that's the first out of the gate of any of the central banks. Um, there is an inevitability of Fed coin happening, of, 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 of the Federal Reserve having um, an electronic currency, but the, the question is how that happens. If you talk to the Uber doves, they want for it to not be anonymous. But Jay Powell and Randy Quarles are both on the record saying if there's going to be Fed coin, it is going to be equally anonymous to the exchange of bills. So wh why do we need a Fed coin? Just because of all the interest in well, Bitcoin? Well, no. At, at some point, it becomes a matter of national security because we know that Russia, China, and Venezuela were the very first three countries out of the gate because they do want, want to monitor what their what their uh, what their citizens are purchasing. At, if, if everybody else on the planet has one and we don't, it's just no bueno. Well, that's sort of the antithesis, though, of Bitcoin, which was to sort of circumvent the government, right? There's an irony there. Does Bitcoin replace the SDR? Is that where it goes? Say again. Does Bitcoin replace the SDR? Mm. Is that, is that what they ultimately do with this thing? Can I get in front of that? Go ahead. Yes. No, excuse me. No, never. Okay. <laughs> Ever. Please, please expound. <laughs> so why, why not? Happen. Why not? It does have to be a medium of exchange, and it is not a medium of exchange. Neither is the SDR. It's true. The SDR isn't either. But until something displaces the dollar as the reserve currency... Nothing else is going to be a medium of exchange. Which is also why the Fed's going to go after it, because they have to maintain their power. Well, true. Billy Dudley told you that. Yes, but the, the, 
the, the leader of China would beg to differ on all this. Well, so. can you imagine if the central <laughs> bank of Russia... He has his eye on the reserve currency status. That is yes, why he has publicly come out, and that's why he's staying for 10 years. But if the central bank of Russia was ahead of the Fed in developing their that's, own... Again, that's, that's it's a technical happen. term. That's no bueno. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not going to happen. Well, there's a medium for criminals. And that's what Bitcoin is as well. So, <laughs> so they're, they're learning quicker. Hey, Gabriella, what are you telling clients about Bitcoin? I mean, honestly, I don't think the interest in cryptocurrencies is going to go away. We hear a lot about it, and we get a lot of questions from clients. My grandpa was just asking me about Bitcoin over New Year's down in Brazil. So I don't think it, us trying to understand it is going to go away. But what we're trying to tell clients is focus much more on the asset classes that we can really understand and assign an intrinsic value to things like stocks, things like bonds, things like other kinds of commodities, if you want to call Bitcoin a commodity. We're not trying to, to become active investors in Bitcoin at this point. No. Jeff, I think you'd agree with that, right? Because it's yeah. not like stocks where you have a conference call, you have an earnings report to parse. If I can't find a reason to buy it on any given day and I can't find a reason to sell it on any given day, I'm just not going to trade it. You know, I'm, so you, you're the stock experts here, not me, but I will say that whatever company is at the forefront of quantum technology, which basically gets rid of how Bitcoin is created and makes it much, much more efficient, whatever technology that is, I'm, I'm putting all my kids' college funds into it. <laughs> and, and we have talked about you know, separating that blockchain technology, right. which underpins the whole idea of, of Bitcoin as well, as something that's interesting. Um, but separating it very much from Bitcoin as kind of a speculative investment. Actually, well, I just stopped uh, yeah. NXTD. I don't own it myself, but I stopped it in the stocks under 10 portfolio. It's, it's been very volatile since Bitcoin went nuts. They're actually a small tech firm, that is, that security firm, that is developing a, an app that would let you use your cryptocurrency value at a store if the store had the same technology. Well, so I, they're and, at, the, at the cutting edge. And Gabriella, to your point, I mean, we've been seeing some companies change their name to include <laughs> blockchain in the stock surges. And that's not similar to 1999 either, is it? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> IPO, ICO, dot com. No, no. No, no similarities. But you bring up a good point because <laughs> could, could a potential crash in Bitcoin spill into the broader stock market? So it was interesting. Um, on, on Bubble Vision, uh, the day that Bitcoin took its first big hiccup, the FANG stocks were all down. And they're like, we just can't put these two together. And That's I'm like, some of them are minors, isn't it? well, yeah. I'm but sorry, but, but yeah. yes. A any, the most egregiously overvalued sectors will be hurt if Bitcoin was to crash. Absolutely. There's sorry, contagion. Do you agree? To some degree. I, I think they get over it pretty quick. I think 99% of people who own and trade stocks don't have any Bitcoin. have never had any Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I, I do like the idea of adding blockchain or Bitcoin to the name of a firm, though. I think Sears should go there. <laughs> well, Jeff, I mean, it's a good point because NVIDIA, right, has only, what, 10, 11% exposure to cryptocurrency, yet a lot of people buy that stock because of it, when in reality, NVIDIA has so many other things that are more exciting. Right, and it's part of the craze, and I think people, they want to buy Bitcoin, they want to buy anything related to Bitcoin, so they'll go into NVIDIA, but that's that's not the the, um, the shareholders that, as a, as, as, as a trust owns NVIDIA, that's not what we want to see. We'd rather see the people using it for gaming and artificial intelligence, the cloud, um, for all of those reasons. Those are the shareholders we'd want to be um, in community with. Yeah. Gabrielle, I mean, w would a drop in Bitcoin cause turmoil in the broader so, I market? I mean, the estimates that we've seen um, put the market cap of, of Bitcoin at around 240 million. I mean, it's or billi a billion, a billion, yeah. 240 billion. Yeah, it's not that small, but still, I mean, it's it's very, very tiny if you compare it to gold, or if you definitely compare it to the stock market, right? So it's not something that's enough to disrupt disrupt consumer confidence or consumer spending or the economy. It's it's still very small share of financial markets. And where does it go when it comes out? After, after the little sell-off we have in, in equities, where does it go after it comes out of Bitcoin? If, if, if there were to be a significant crash in Bitcoin. Or, or can, you get your can you get your money out of Bitcoin? Well, that's the big well, question. Well, yeah, the market cap might be a lot smaller on right, the day you right. need it, you know? <laughs> so. Well, that's the question. But again, <laughs> to me, Bitcoin is much more beyond what it actually is, which I... <clears throat> Anyways, um, <laughs> moving past that, uh, it really is a reflection of how much of the speculative fervor that's out there right now, that, that, mm. that there's no place to be but speculative assets. Mm. And that, to me, is, is wh where Bitcoin could have a contagion effect. It's not the size of, of the market cap. I know it's tiny, um, but it's much more so what it reflects about investor psyches. Well, it's also rebellion. 
It's, it's people who don't even invest, but they have Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rebellion among the younger people, the people that are fed up with whatever they see before them. And that's not like 1999 either. <laughs> well, well. There's a theme here. You sound very negative. The one thing I can't wrap my head around is that if, if, if people are using it for a medium of exchange, um, but you own Bitcoin because you think it's going to go higher. Why would you use it to buy something down the street? Yeah. I feel like you'd, you'd just rather have cash. Is there an NBA team that sells their tickets for Bitcoin? If, I, I don't know if there are actually trades, I, but they're willing to. I think this, this, it's the Sacramento Kings. They might have some type yeah. of involvement with imagine, Bitcoin. Imagine realizing you just spent like, the value of two new cars on exactly. basketball tickets. And you own it because you think it's going to go <laughs> higher, whereas the dollar, at least you have inflation as a type of tracking mechanism mm -hmm. for it. I just can't wrap my head around that. Well, there are so many new cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. popping up almost on a daily basis. We now have Ripple, which has a market cap of... Douglas Borthwick actually a, came out and supported. And yeah. Borthwick's a smart kid. I had a 17-year-old yeah. yeah. ask me about Ripple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but the market cap is now $112 billion. Just like that? Just like that. It was at 25 cents in December. And it's still cheap enough to buy. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to say it. I'm just not. Somebody else say it for me. <laughs> okay, got it. But, but how do you process something like that when, when there's a new craze almost on a weekly basis? I don't. I don't process it, okay? I keep doing business the way I, I've always done it. I like to... F I will trade on technicals. I will trade on my fundamental analysis. I use both. Sometimes I mesh them. Sometimes I don't. If a stock certainly respects technicals more than another stock. But I, I use the stuff that's worked for me since I was a kid. I, I, don't, I don't go somewhere with, where I'm uncomfortable and I don't know what I'm doing. All right, I Warren think Buffett would be so proud. Gosh. <laughs> we'll leave the Bitcoin dis We'll leave the Bitcoin discussion there. I want to get to our last 8 minutes and we'll focus on tail risk for the market. So one thing you're watching in 2018 that could derail everything. We'll go around the table, Gabriella. One thing we've talked about is, you know, when we were doing our 2018 outlook and we have this positive view on global growth, um, on risk assets, things like equities, like high yield, um, emerging markets, everything depends on inflation remaining relatively subdued, right? And as a result, this removal of monetary policy accommodation to still be incredibly, incredibly gradual. Mm -hmm. So that's one risk we're watching is really inflation. And if you think about the end of last year, the last three months or so of, of releases have shown a pickup in core inflation in the U.S. So it's not like there is no inflation anywhere. Uh, and as we've mentioned, we continue to expect a really, really tight labor market and perhaps some wage pressure as well. So that's something we're watching. Okay. Sarge? Well, the obvious risk is the withdrawal of liquidity and how it works out. But what do, how do I answer this question most of the times you ask me? North Korea. Damn right. All right. <laughs> North Korea. A nuclear bomb goes off somewhere. That is the major risk to global economies and markets, bar none. But, you know, when we saw President Trump tweet the other day about nuclear buttons, I mean, that was, that was quite a tweet. The markets didn't flinch at all. Obviously very different from an actual bomb going off. The political no longer affects us, okay? Even the geopolitical, if we don't believe it, no longer affects us. All right, it, it actually has to be an event at this point. Minor terrorist attacks don't even affect us anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, it would have to be a major terrorist attack. It would have to be a major military action or something, God forbid, like I just mentioned, that would get the attention of the markets. Let's not forget, algorithms run these markets now, all right? It's not guys like me beating up on other guys like me anymore. There's only a few of us that are still looking at things, trying, trying to figure out what the algos are doing and trying to beat the algos at their game. The algorithms are all designed by guys who look at charts like we do, but then they go read about the Knicks and the Rangers. Oh, oh is the market moving? Oh, 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 the Knicks lost. Oh. And the rest of us is still, we're out there. We're in the weeds, we're hiding, and we're taking their lunch. All right, I think you oversimplified it. But, <laughs> Jeff, one thing to worry about in 2018. Um, I, I would agree with geopolitical risk and those types of tensions. I, I think that there's just a lot of positive factors going on specifically for 2018. I know maybe longer term might be a different story, but um, just from a little narrow mind, 2018, uh, I think we're set up pretty well. Mm -hmm. Danielle? Um, it, it was interesting that HSBC overseas was kind of the first place that subprime showed up. So um, way back in, in 2006, 2007. I think that this time, if there is a financial crisis, it's going to start off our shores. Hmm. So I'll be watching the European bond market very, very closely as this taper gets underway. And you think that's a 2018 risk? Well, if, he, if, if Draghi's serious about cutting his QE in half, it is an aggressive move on the part of the ECB despite his dovishness. I'll be watching the European bond you market. Have you talked to Peter Scheer? I have, yes. Yeah, he, 
You and him should talk a lot. He's a smart kid. He thinks like you. <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> Somewhat of a compliment. <laughs> Sarge, you mentioned political risk earlier, that it almost doesn't matter, but we do have the Mueller investigation. Many strategists... Nobody believes it anymore. No right? one believes it the anymore. The market doesn't believe it. I'm not saying there's nothing there, because I don't know. But the market's not buying the story anymore. The market thinks the mar that life goes on. Yeah, there'll be a reaction. If there was an, an earth-shattering re revelation... Yeah, okay. But you know what? Two weeks after that revelation, they'd be like, oh, President Pence, okay. But and they, the, and the algos would kick back in. There will be increased um, scrutiny as we get closer to the midterm elections. Mm -hmm. So there is, it's, it's not just geopolitical. It is, I think it is also political well, as, as well, we veer towards the midterm elections. Which this economy, which is growing and, and it's going to fight liquidity towards the end of the year, how important is that going to be? We just mentioned April and September is... And leading into November? Oh, this is going to be... Gonna well, be I, I, I think you're, you're, she's talking about the, the possibility of, of a change in, in guard oh, in the absolutely. House and Senate. And we had Byron Wien. That was one of his predictions, that the Democrats would take both the House and the Senate. So right. what could that mean for the markets? That means that, that Washington goes back into absolute gridlock. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a November story, too, because in 16, well, the polls were noticed, this warped also. But if you dropping like flies, mm -hmm. I, I mean... People well, the, the Senate balance is now 51 to 49. percent growth. Retirement announcements, I mean, they're coming left and right. If you so give me 3.5% growth, the Republicans won't lose a seat. You don't know that, though. I mean, the polls, they're going to be campaigning. They're already campaigning now. It's going to continue, obviously, up until the yeah, they November. they always campaign. Guess what? If you, if you put money in people's pockets and they grow, and, they, and there's growth, and they believe they have a shot, they don't change a thing. Now... I'm not making any kind of political statement. I'm telling you how people react. And last year, 11 months out, Hillary was a sure thing. She was a sure thing two days out. You just don't we know. We will see that 3% by the end of it. I mean, we will see that 3%. Does anything politically get done this year? Obviously, we just had tax reform. Do we get infrastructure? Do we get health care? I, I, I think the Democrats are licking their wounds right now. I, I think that they feel like they're, they're, they, they failed on some count because the because actual legislation was passed. But remember, Obama got one piece of legislation passed as well, and that was Obamacare, before he faced gridlock and Congress flipped. Well, he had Dodd-Frank, you know, there were, he, he had some. Well, yes, um, but, uh, but, but I would say that, that as we get closer, that there's going to be acute focus. And my greatest concern is that we have a, a mid-year slowdown after all the sugar high effects of the rebuilding comes through, and it would be terrible timing for that slowdown to come in the middle of the year if you're a Republican. I'm not a Republican. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm pointing, I'm to, I'm I'm pointing to your point <laughs> more, more than anything else. I mean, th this is an apolitical statement. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that if, if, we, as there, if there's increasing... Uh, if there's an increasing probability that the, Dem that the Democrats are going to take Congress, the markets will not like it. Yeah, Gabrielle, are you getting calls about U.S. political risk in 2018? No, we're not that much at this point. Um, I think, you know, everyone's still focused on the passage of tax reform pretty recently, uh, thinking about adding that already to a fire that was building quite nicely in terms of economic growth. I honestly don't think there's that much expectation around much else getting done from the political policy side in 2018. So it's still a pretty supportive environment, even if there's gridlock or even if yeah. nothing else so gets no done at a I don't think that's expected or priced not in not at all. At yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. the, 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 the Democrats are going to do everything in their power to not pass anything, even though prior to tax cuts, infrastructure was very much bipartisan. What about a crackdown on foreign steel? I think, we're, I think we'll see a, uh, an update to 232 with Wilbur Ross, and, and that's going to greatly benefit the domestic steel industry. And, and Nucor is a holding of actual yeah, Plus. Yeah, we hold Nucor. They're one of the largest steel uh, producers in the country. I, steel's just involved in too many things here, and I think it's, it's really it's, it's more buttoning up your tracks um, to mm -hmm. keep everything in-house. And not to downplay the, the victory of tax reform, that was passed through reconciliation, and you know, they're not necessarily going to have that again this year. Right. Actually, revising my answer to, to what you asked me in terms of are we getting calls from clients about politics or policy in 2018, um, I tend to focus a lot on Latin America as well. And we have started getting questions around trade, not just steel, but if you get something around NAFTA, NAFTA. right? That's coming up at the end of January in the sixth round. Our expectation is for it to be completed in some fashion by the end of the first quarter. So that's the kind of 
noise, I think, would be seen as more on the negative side. Um, and we have been getting some questions on that. Danielle, we'll can, give you the last word. Canada is another tail risk as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be that would be a death knell for the Canadian economy. And they've got a, a household debt situation that is an, an accident waiting to happen. So we do not want to have a recession north or south of our borders. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we are out of time for this hour. Sarge, Gabriella, Jeff, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you back here next month. We'll leave you with a look at the snow outside our window on Wall Street.